Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on when this video finds you. Just want to talk a little bit about business ownership in our black communities and the lack of it. Uh, a little bit of what happened and where we need to go from here. Because a little bit over 100 years ago, well, let's just go back and say uh, right, right at slavery ended, a lot of our black ancestors actually went into business for themselves because they did not want to work for anyone else. They had spent their existence working under the oppressive thumb of the master, so they wanted to have some control and bring it back to their own lives. Now, right today, we still have a, we have a lot of black business owners, but relative to our population size in this country, our business ownership is quite small. And so what happened? We got off track somewhere and our black ancestors were so in tune with business that Booker T. Washington and some other blacks started what we call the National Negro Business League at the turn of the 20th century. And each year, for a number of years, they would have an annual convention. And at that convention, black men and women would come, they would exchange ideas with one another. They would help others who were struggling in business, tell them what they needed to do to get their business up and running properly. They would teach others who didn't have businesses how they how to get started and you know what type of character traits they needed to have to succeed in business. And uh, I was actually, my wife and I were actually talking yesterday. It's about uh, about one in the morning right now, but we were talking on yesterday and we were talking about how the customer service aspect is pretty much dead, especially when we're dealing with black people. Uh, we have a tendency when we deal with each other, we think we can lower the standards because we share the same skin tone. And as much as I try to give us a chance, it's, it's grown old, it's grown tired. You know, uh, it's just unfortunate. You know, I'm not gonna put any particular names out there or any businesses out there, uh, but I will say I am frustrated with doing business with us. And so we got off back, off, off, off track. I was gonna try to mix, mix base and track up together and you see what happened. But we got off track at some point because we started listening to the wrong people. Now we had men and women who were becoming rich. We had men and women, black, who were becoming wealthy during this time. And if you were to get a copy of my book, but hey, what do I know from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or you can email me at myronjones at gmail.com. That's M-Y-R-A-N-J-O-N-E-S at gmail.com. You will see where I talk about a lot of black men and women who had grown very wealthy. I mean, the only wealth we're ever taught about for the most part is Madam C.J. Walker. And we're talking about Black Wall Street. But outside of that, we're not really taught about other black multimillionaires. And there were a lot of them. And uh, But if you get my book, you can see a whole lot of those. You can read about a lot of those. But we got off track. And we allowed people, black people, who had never built anything, we allowed them to talk us out of business ownership. And the problem that these black educated masses in the MSI, the problem they had with the business owners was the business owners were spending a whole lot of time in colleges and universities. They went to work because they said they want ownership. And just like I was taught, I'm pretty sure many of you were taught the same thing. Go to school, get a good education so you can get a good job. The part of the phrase that we were never taught was after job was in white America, in corporate white America. That's what that's what they were teaching us without actually saying it. Because if you check any of those people that taught us that, just think about the type of companies they told you to try to get a job in, to get your job in. And so they didn't feel like black owned businesses carried the prestige as white America. And so they started 
putting these black business owners down because they suffered from a spirit of jealousy and envy. And they couldn't understand how these uneducated formal were outpacing them economically because these educated black masses in the Emmy Silent were broke. They were busted and they were disgusted with these black men and women who had started businesses and were becoming very uh, wealthy in the process. See, history doesn't teach us that. And so Booker T. Washington was putting so much work in that he literally worked himself to death through his travels and all of the work that he was doing when building Tuskegee and all of that. And in 1915, in his early 50s, Booker T. Washington passed. And if anybody knows me, I'm a great fan of Booker T. Washington. And around 1909, you had another black organization started. And it wasn't started by black folks, but they call it colored anyway. And so their whole objective was to destroy any black economic progress. See, history won't teach you that about that organization either. So when Booker T. Washington died in 1915, the full out assault took place on going after black business owners. And unfortunately, we see that throughout our history time and time again. We have a tendency to look only to one leader. And when Booker T. Washington died, the other blacks who were working with him with him with the National Negro Business League, they didn't step up to the plate. That's why we need several leaders with a vision that's similar to one another that wants to move in the same direction. So if one leader uh, falls ill, gets sick, uh, passes on, anything happens that the organization, and I'm not even saying we need an organization, but our race doesn't miss a beat you know as old songs say and the beat goes on and so we that's the type of mentality we need to recapture because once they went on full assault against those business owners they didn't target the black men and women who were business owners they targeted the black men and women who were also struggling economically and they told them that those business men and women were out of tune. They were out of touch with the great majority of black people. And they needed to boycott their businesses and secure jobs in white America as well. What a, just think about that thinking right there. Because a lot of those black men and women who started boycotting those black business owners were actually employed by the very people they were boycotting because they listened to people who didn't have anything to offer them economically. And we haven't recovered from that yet. And in the mid, I think 1920s, there was a gentleman named S.B. Fuller. Went door to door with $25 selling soap. And in the mid, 50s to the mid 60s S.B. Fuller was one of the richest black men in the whole United States uh, I forget how many different companies he owned but he bought companies and he received an award one year for top manufacturer of the year and things like that and S.B. Fuller understood just like Booker T. Washington understood racism was going on discrimination was going on but both of them had the same philosophy. Hey, let's build up some economics and break down some of these barriers. The only way you can break down a lot of these barriers is to get economics that you control. Not that somebody else is controlling, like as our entertainers and uh, our professional athletes. You know, I heard Charles Barkley say years ago, we're a bunch of rich guys trying to fight a, bu a bunch of wealthy guys. He said there's a great difference when they were having that NBA lockout while he was still in the league because he was part of the NBA player junior. And so we can go get jobs. We can go get high paid jobs and you know feel like we have a degree of riches, but you can't go fight a system of wealth with riches. 
I mean, that's just the way it is. And so SB4 and Booker T. Washington said, hey, let's build something we control so they can't take it away from us. And because SB4, just like Booker T. Washington, didn't spend time protesting civil rights issues, SB Fuller didn't. And because of this, he started being ostracized by our civil rights leaders. And even the one we still celebrate every January. He was one of the biggest opponents of SB Fuller. And he started telling black people, don't support SB Fuller's businesses. SB Fuller was employing over 4,000 people at the time, black and white. So what kind of sense did it make for us as black people to boycott our livelihood? Does that even make sense? Let me ask you a question. How many black people have ever boycotted the white companies they work for? I'll let you chew on that for a minute because I'm going to keep moving. But just think about it. He had another guy during that same period as, as, as before named A.G. Gaston. And uh, I have one of his books here as well. And there was always a toss-up during that period of well, who was the richest between S.B. Fuller and A.G. Gaston. But most of us have never heard of either one of these guys. And so we started listening to people in the early part of the 20th century. We started listening to people in the middle part of the 20th century. And we're still listening to people who haven't built anything right today. I was reading in the book of Jasher, chapter 83, verse 39, because I read in the missing books of the Bible as well. And I found out that those missing books were removed. Well, they're not missing. They were removed. Uh, they were removed for a reason. Those books didn't want us to really know who we were. They didn't want us to know our power. I mean, those books let us know our strength and our power and our might and how strong we are as a people. And that's why those books were removed from our eyesight. And so you can still, you can find them online now, but you can also find them in print form as well. But if you don't know about it, you don't know what you don't know. And so in the book of Jasher, chapter 83, verse 39, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, this was during the time when the 12 were sent, you know, the leader of each tribe was sent to look at that land. And God had told them to take the land. And so they sent the 12 out and 10 came back. And they said, the people are too mighty. They're too strong. And the other two came back and they said, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's ours for the table. What did the Israelites do? Jasher 8339 said they complained and sided with the majority. And what do we as black people do right today? We listen to the majority. We will not listen to the minority voices in our black circles. And I'm going to tell you something. Our minority black voices are the one that's trying to lead us to freedom. But we don't want to listen to it. Because we're at the point now as a people where we can't think for ourselves. So because we can't think for ourselves, we have to follow the black masses and the MSI. And so that's what we keep doing. I mean, we're the only people. I mean, just, just take our vote. I mean, that, that's the hot topic right now. We got Kamala Harris as Joe Biden's VP. We had Obama as our black president. He wasn't the first black president. Do your, do your own research. But that's the big issue. Now, other than a feeling from Kamala Harris, Kamala, Kamala, I, I don't know exactly how to pronounce the name. I've heard it so many different ways, but y'all know who I'm talking about. Other than getting a feeling from her being a black woman, other than Obama being black president, other than getting the feeling, what do we have to show for our loyalty? 
And that goes to the whole point. And I'm not saying the Republicans are doing anything for us either, but you can't go to the Republicans asking them to do something for you, and you won't even support them. I mean, they get about 8% of the black vote, and that's, that's in a good year. And so we keep asking the Republicans what they're going to they're do for us, but we won't even support them. It's like I wrote in my book. You can't be married to one woman who won't meet any of your needs and then go across the street to the neighbor woman and ask her to perform wifely duties. But that's what we're doing with our politics. And that's what we do with all of these black media talking heads who have been put in place by white America to manage the rest of us grassroots blacks. Y'all don't understand our history. And so when we see these people telling us one thing, but the evidence is right in front of us and we just refuse to take the evidence and we know the evidence is true, but we just can't break away from the monolithic group. It's just like I read um, something years ago and the gentleman said, slaves want to be released from the oppressor, but they don't want to be released from the oppression. And so we can look at that another way and say, as blacks, we don't want to be micromanaged by the system, but we still want to be managed by the system. And how can I say that? It's because our behavior and actions keep dictating the very same thing. The system has proven that it's not our friend. And so we're dealing with economics. We can't get politicians to move on our behalf because we don't have any money. Period. With a T, like my sister says when she's making fun. Period. And so they don't listen to us. They listen to the people that have the money. And so you look at what's thriving in our communities. As I said before, um, growing up, I live in the same area that I grew up in. I'm about, I live about two miles away from my parents' house. And we live in a house that my wife grew up in. Now, about half a mile from my parents' house, there's a grocery store. I mean, it's been there for years. It was black owned when I was a little boy. I'm 49 now. And the uh, owner at the time got sick. I think I might have been around middle school, high school. And he sold it and it's exchanged hands several times but it hasn't had touched black hands since that gentleman owned it when I was a kid. They're never going to relinquish that control. They're never going to relinquish that asset. And there's another grocery store that's about a mile from my parents' house. It's a local chain, but it's not black owned. It's never been black owned. And we don't own it. I mean, there are a couple of family dollars around the area now. Um, you have your McDonald's, you have your KFC and Popeye's. Uh, what else do you have? I think there's a Taco Bell. I think that and KFC share the same building. Then you have uh, another chick, few other chicken places, a few fish, fried fish places. We have AutoZone and O'Reilly, Subway, Little Caesars. Uh, there's a small engine repair shop. Uh, the guy that runs that grew up with me. Uh, I took it over from his dad. There's a used tire place, not black owned. There's a club that's hole in the wall club that's been around since before I was born. It's black owned. We we have thriving barber and beauty shops. And but the biggest uh, <laughs> business in the black community is the church. <laughs> And uh, how can I say that? I counted them one day looking at Google Maps because I didn't want to just, I mean, I've driven the whole area. I know my whole area fairly well. 
but I didn't want to get off track and double count some, so I went to Google Maps one day, and I counted how many churches were within a five-mile radius, and I'm being very generous in the five miles. I think it's actually less, five square miles. There were 42 churches. Now, 42 churches within a five-mile radius, and like I said, I'm being generous with that. And the area I live in in Houston is ranked in the top 10 every year in violent crime. I think the last time we were, we were at number six. And I'm not sure where we stand now, but at one point we had the highest number of HIV cases in the whole city of Houston. And we have crime all the time. I mean, at one point you can even go to the, the local home grocery store chain they were robbing people in the parking lot and unfortunately almost every black community in this country looks the same way and they're not looking that way they're not a perfect aesthetic look it's one that looks like degradation and business ownership is suffering on our behalf because we're still trying to be everybody else's employees. Just think about it. You go to a job, if you live in one of the predominant black communities, your access to quality restaurants is limited. Your access to quality places to shop for clothes is very limited. You have no car dealerships. I mean, you have some used car lots that if I I mean, I haven't dealt with them, but I would hope I would never have to. I'll just put it that way. But you don't have any major car dealerships around. The more you can buy a brand new car. You don't have any hospitals other than being close to the medical center. And right now, uh, where we live is in close proximity because they're gentrifying all of the predominantly black areas right now. And I hear us talk about gentrification all the time. I know we gentrifying ourselves. And how can I say that? We don't want to live in a black community that we <laughs> grew up in. So whenever you have white flight, black flight is right behind it. Because we want to be in their presence still right today. And so when they live out in the burbs, we want to live in the burbs. And Several studies have been done said every time the black presence in a predominantly white neighborhood gets to be greater than 8%, whites are going to start leaving again. And so, I'm taking my word for nothing. Look it up for yourself. But we're gentrifying ourselves. And right now, based on what's happened in Houston over the last 25 to 30 years, is the neighborhood I live in. Is pretty much the last one that hasn't been totally gentrified, but they're working on it. And because we have close access, the medical center is, I think, seven miles from my house. The reason I know that, I spent a lot of time with doctors and hospitals the last couple of years. So it's seven miles from my house, 14 miles round trip. And matter of fact, on yesterday, um, had to go see a doctor again. So, you know, um, and right before you get to the medical center, I think NRG Stadium is about five miles from my house. Downtown Houston, Toyota Center, and Minute Maid Park and the uh, uh, hockey stadium are all in, you know, distance of, of probably a mile of each other. You know, they all sit in downtown. And downtown from my house is less than 10 miles. And so now because of the access that we have in this, this inner city, what we would call poverty stricken black community, they want access to it now. And what we're seeing now is if there is an old dilapidated house that one of us have left behind because we didn't want to pay taxes, we didn't want to be in this area anymore. And there is an open spot, you know, we're seeing whites come in and build brand new homes a lot of them don't want to live in this area but they just want 
easy access to the places they work during the week and then they go to their real homes on the weekend. And so even not far from here, I guess it's about uh, maybe three miles from here, maybe build some three-story high rises starting at the 350s <laughs> because they're trying to make everything comfortable for uh, the medical center folks. I mean, I, I'm on next door, the next door social site and uh, <laughs> one of those people over there was complaining because they had a power outage and that elevator was out. <laughs> I mean, whew, that's a struggle, ain't it? <laughs> but we don't have any viable businesses because we've listened to the wrong people. Now, we have all of these foreigners who've come in and they've placed businesses in our community. And the problem with that is at the end of the day, they take all of our power into the neighborhood that they live. So we're giving our power away and then they're taking it and putting it in their community. Now, I know there are some as I stated before, there are some systemic discrimination and racism aspects going on. And so a lot of them can get loans that we can't. I mean, and they can start businesses and they can keep changing the name of the ownership in the business and they can avoid paying taxes for quite some time. And so they learn how to play the system where we get played by the system. And I can tell you right now, they will not let one of us come into their community that they predominate and allow us to set up shop there. It ain't gonna happen. And that's what we need to understand. So we need to learn how to start starving their businesses. That's what we need to learn how to do. And I know a lot of people have had trouble securing business loans in the past. Now, if we had trouble before securing business loans, what do you think is going to happen right now in the midst of everything we're dealing with? And so, even with a perfect credit score, they still don't want to give us a loan because society has told them we're not trustworthy. And I mean, you can see in a lot of things we do, we're just not as sophisticated in doing things as other people because they're not going to teach us how to work around the system. And so we're going to have to figure out some things. There are opportunities out there um, to earn some income. And I heard a guy say, you know, I, didn't, I don't do the business I'm in because I like it. He said, make no mistake about it. He said, I don't do my business because I like it. He said, I do it because it works. He said, I do it because it provides my lifestyle for me and my family. He said, and I've actually been able to help other people help their families get out of debt, and give to charity and afford some of the kids' talents that just having a job won't allow you. And so you know, you start thinking about that, but we've been so conditioned away from business in any regard that we can't even see ourselves as business owners. And I tell you what, if we had some economics, I guarantee our politics would change because now our politicians know they have to come up off of that lip service that they pay us. The reason other people get things done is because they have economics behind their words. So why do you think these other organizations always get things done? Because the politicians know when these people speak, if they speak, we promise them something and we don't do it, we're going to be gone. They're not going to donate to us anymore because that's what economics does to politics. You know, it's said it has to be that way because your politicians are actually supposed to serve you, not the other way around. They come and 
run up in our churches during election time, smile, and you ever notice they always got two people with them? That's their security because they don't even trust you. They're scared of you, so they bring security into your churches to protect them from you. And we ain't figured that out yet. They'll come in and, you know, lie to us, lie to these jack leg preachers to get them them preachers to lead us down the path of destruction and then they disappear on us until the next next election cycle and we ain't figured it out yet they play us so we go and vote that straight d ticket you know ain't no need in even looking at the candidate just vote a straight ticket with a d on it and what do we have to show for it nothing i mean we had a council Councilman, you know, he was bragging about a new HEB going up in a certain area and talking about it for black people. Well, if you go look what the story is, he built it in the medical, it was built in the medical center. He didn't build it. So it wasn't really being catered to us, it was being catered to the people that are moving in now. We better wake up. And I sent him a message about that. And, you know, of course, like the rest of them, I never heard back from him, but I didn't expect to. But we need to get some economics. We need to start some businesses. And you're going to have to figure out how to start business, a business that doesn't require loans. You're going to have to get over yourself. You're going to have to get over some misrepresentation. I know some people won't look at a certain business industry because somebody misrepresented the industry. But ironically, these same people will go and apply for a new job even though somebody may have misrepresented the job they're on but they will keep going to apply for a new job here new job there new job there you're applying for a new job because you're disgusted with your old job but why do we keep going to the same system that's not working for us to try and make it work it is not designed to work when are we gonna figure that out yet and i mean i know it you know at one point in history we thought school teachers were secure well virtual learning started coming on the scene quite some some time back but it came on the scene after homeschooling well guess what two industries are growing right now homeschooling and virtual learning now, a lot of people have actually pulled their kids out of the public school system and start homeschooling them because they say, well, if I got to work at home with my kids on the education, what am I, what I need to teach it for? So if more and more parents start doing that, what's going to happen to the school teaching profession? But you know what I hear school teachers talking about all the time? They keep trying to defund public education. Well, in all honesty, it was never supposed to be anything such as public education. <laughs> it was all supposed to be done by the parents. See, that's another part of history you're not taught. And I heard a preacher say years ago, he said, when you turn over your function to the government, then the gov you have to pay the government for doing what you were ordained to do he said and it's called taxation he said so we turned over education of our kids to the government he said so we got to pay the government for educating our kids and i mean look at the education if we can even call it that nowadays that the kids are getting these kids are having trouble with basic skills because the system is teaching them toward a test. And it's been proven time and time and time and time again that the kids who perform best later on in life are the ones who get the basic fundamentals. And so we can look at a lot of these companies and there are a lot of white companies, white owned companies still today. They may have bought other companies, but you know, they have some ties to slavery. And that's unfortunate. 
you know, I saw back in June, I believe, uh, Lords of London came out and said they were going to try to do something for black people for insuring all that cargo, and that, you know, that came across the Atlantic Ocean. And I think uh, the state of North Carolina just like, you know, said they were going to give some reparation. And uh, it's always amazing that every other group that has received reparation received it directly into their hand. But every time you talk about doing something for black folks, we want to put it somewhere and determine what we're going to do with it. That's going to be managed by a black manager. So <laughs> we need to learn how to get our own economics in place. That's not going to happen if we keep following the same pattern we've been following since those black misleaders told us this back in the early part of the 20th century upon the passing of Booker T. Washington. Why did they ostracize Booker T. Washington? He was teaching black business ownership. Why did they ostracize Marcus Garvey? He was teaching black business ownership. Why did they ostracize S.B. Fuller? He was teaching black business ownership. Reginald Lewis, as I stated, first person ever of any skin color to create a billion dollar buyout. And if you read his biography, why should white men or white guys have all the fun? You'll see his brother in there, he said one word you were never ever allowed to use around Reginald was the word racism. He said he remember Reginald's first semester at college, his roommate said somebody the what the man is trying to keep him down. And like I said, Reginald Lewis knew it existed. He never denied that. But he said, you don't speak defeat into your life before the opportunity even gets to you. He said, and anytime you start out talking about the white man is trying to hold me down, he said, you've already lost. He said, there's no need in going for it. And I know a lot of people don't believe that speaking has anything to do with the way we live. And I've heard people all over say, we live at the level that we speak. And Reginald Lewis said, hey, don't speak defeat into your life. And what we keep doing is we keep speaking defeat. I mean, as I've stated all throughout this video, I know there are systemic issues. And so we're going to have to learn how to get some economics. And I guarantee you, we won't complain as much. Oh, yeah, sure, that's going to be issues. There's always been issues. I mean, we can even go in the book of Galatians and see uh, where racism was prevalent uh, with Peter. And so racism is always going to be around because it just is. And we need to... I mean, we can we can try to combat it, but we can't change another man's heart. That man has to change his heart. And if his heart is set on evil, ain't nothing you or I gonna do to make him change his thought process. That's just the way it is. And so, so I'm I'm just talking now. You know, like I said, my mind activates itself a lot more. When it's late at night and it's quiet outside, there are no cars running up and down the street. My phone's not ringing unless it, my mentor is going to call me. And in many cases, he's going to send me a text first to see if I'm up. And even if I'm asleep, yes, I'm up. Because anytime he wants to talk, I'm going to make myself available. That's just the way it is. And so we look at all of the black people that are speaking on our behalf that are so-called acting on our behalf, ask yourself this question. What have these black people done for us? I mean, 
think about it since 1964 the only thing that we've got more of is more violence more abortion more homosexuality more politicians the thing we don't have is economics and that's unfortunate you know we we got to get on above this economic chain I mean there's nothing wrong with college as I stated but have you seen the hourly rate for some of these uh, jobs that only require maybe an associate's degree or maybe just a little time in technical school trade school or something like that I mean some of these people are not living shabby lives, they're not earning shabby incomes. And so you think about what college is costing right now. I know what it costs my granddaughter for a year to go to college. And my nephew just started college. And his tuition is almost double hers, if not double. And I mean, the amount I'm talking about is more than what people make in a year. And where my nephew is going, uh, it's more than what the average income for a black American is in this country right now. The average income for a black American in this country right now is, I think, roughly $35,000, if I remember correctly. And his tuition costs more than that. So, put four four or five years of that on top of each other without scholarship and I'm not saying he didn't, he got scholarship but just think about the kids who don't get scholarships and have to take out loans because they're not giving out the Pell Grants anymore as far as I know because the system wants you to come out in debt bondage but we keep promoting debt bondage by calling it degree and so take a you know, let's just say 40,000 a year let's just say that I, I know his tuition is more than that but let's just say 40,000 a year and I want to keep it simple for math's sake because like I said the average income for a black person is 35,000 roughly so let's just say 40,000 a year and let's just say you have to take a loan out for every year in school so if you go to school and you get your degree in four years, that's $160,000 in loan. If it takes you five years to get that degree, that's $200,000. Now, listen to those two figures. How much does a brand new house cost? <laughs> I mean, even at, if you find a school that uh, only costs 10000 a year, at the end of four years, that's forty. At the end of five years, that's fifty. How much does a new car cost? The decent. I'm not saying the cheap ones are not decent. I'm just saying, you know, something with some amenities, you know. And so we got to think about what we're promoting to our kids. I remember talking to a couple some time back, and we were just talking about putting things in place. To make sure your kids could stand on your shoulders and because that's what we're supposed to do we're supposed to be creating an environment where our kids can stand on their shoulders they they still shouldn't be standing right next to us when they get started in life they should be standing on our shoulders so they can see further than what we saw and I was talking to the couple and the guy said man I don't want my kids to start off better than me I said well why not he said well I don't want them to think life is easy I said well you don't think they're still gonna have challenges even if they start off standing on top of your shoulders no I won't I had to struggle so they're gonna have to struggle too and with that mentality being passed on to his kids that guess what mentality his kids are gonna pass on they're gonna pass on a broke mentality that's what we call poverty thinking because we're not educating them we're not telling them hey I want you to stand on my shoulders I want you to see further than me and your mom could see and so 
we keep re repeating that same cycle of brokenness. You know what we can also call that? We can call that a generational curse. And I think one day I'm going to do a video on generational curses. I mean, like I said, I'm just talking now. You know, I was told before I needed to cut my videos down because nobody's going to listen to, nobody wants to listen to a video that's more than about 10 minutes. And I see the analytics on my videos. You know, a lot of them not even listen 10 minutes anyway. I'm doing 10 minute videos, they're still not listening. So, what I found out when I mentioned I was talking, the people that want the information are going to listen no matter how long it is. There's one guy I subscribed to on YouTube. I don't think he has a video less than two hours long. But I subscribe to him, and when I listen, I listen because I want the information. I want to learn. I'm in a constant state of learning each and every day. I read in the morning when I first get up. I read before I go to bed at night. I read throughout the course of the day. And that's one of the biggest areas where we're falling as a people. We will not read. Oh, we can talk about that NBA right now because they just started back up. But you sat at home for five and a half months with no new television shows, no sports at all, no access to movie theaters. I mean, you got streaming, but no access to entertainment for the most part. And I guarantee you, probably less than 5% spent those five and a half months trying to better themselves mentally. And you know who that 5% were? Those are your rich people, those are your wealthy people, and those are, are the people that's trying to improve their lives. 95% of the population, I guarantee you, didn't open a book. And I read in a book every day. At one point, when my wife and I both had full-time jobs, we read more when we both had full-time jobs because we knew the job, it wasn't the job itself, the people on the jobs had so much negative. And when you take all these people, depending on how many you work with, all these people bringing their negative together, you're compounding the negative that you have to deal with each day. So you have to put good in to get good out. If you don't put good in, that means garbage comes in. So the only thing that can come out is garbage. So it's giggle. Either way, you look at it, good in, good out, garbage in, good garbage out. So we used to keep track of how many pages we read each week. And on average, my wife would probably read 600 plus pages a week. On average, I was reading probably close to a thousand or more per week. And that was every week because we purposed ourselves that we wanted to get better as people. We weren't doing it for anybody else. We were doing it for ourselves. And I, one of the things I cannot stand is when I hear people say, I don't have time to read. Oh, did you stream something today? Did you watch TV today? Did you watch sports, a sports event today? Did you hang out? with your friends a little bit longer today and if you hung out with your friend <laughs> I guarantee you most of them are negative <laughs> you know if you go to your job at some point during the day you will get a lunch break 30 minutes to an hour you mean to tell me you can't open a book during your lunch break at some part of the day, we have bodily functions that need to be taken care of. You mean to tell me why you're taking care of a bodily function? You can't crack open a book and read? No, what you're telling me is you just don't want to. You don't want to improve yourself. My wife and I are in a constant state of improvement. I'm not going to say change. I'm going to say improvement. Because improvement sounds so much better. And so we don't read 
And when we have our kids, we don't encourage our kids to read, and the cycle keeps repeating itself. And I heard a pastor say years ago, he said, if all you know is one thing, that's all you can teach your kid. He said, so if you teach and if you ignorant, the only thing you can teach is ignorance. He said, your kids will value what you value. And I remember when my granddaughter was a little girl, I mean, followed me around everywhere. <laughs> I couldn't go anywhere. And uh, it's ironic that she's going to college in the same town that she originally was born in. And she used to, when she started elementary school, she used to always ask me to come down there and have lunch with her once a week. And I did it with no hesitation. Every Friday I would go down. I even did it for my grandson too. I would go down and visit. And she got her car last month. <laughs> and uh, this is her second year of college. And she got her car last month. And she drove down because they had to check in last week. And she called my wife and said, she called me BP. She said, I don't know how BP did this all those years coming down here to bring lunch with, to me. <laughs> she said, I got tired just driving down here for the first time ever. <laughs> but we do what we do when we love. And child abuse can come in many forms. You know, child abuse doesn't always constitute taking a belt and whooping the kids. Child abuse doesn't always constitute calling your kids derogatory names all throughout their childhood. Child abuse can come in a form of never spending time with them. Child abuse can come in a form of never praising them when they do good things. And I'm not just saying, you know, just throw praise out there where they, there's no love in it. I'm talking about properly praising. And there's a certain way you do that because you don't want them to get an overinflated ego where they just thought, as we used to say when I played football, reading their own press clippings. Child abuse is you don't like to read, so you're not going to encourage your child to read. Everything in this child's life is going to hinge on two things reading and math and if they can't do those two things they're going to struggle in society i remember when i got to university of houston i was an honor student from elementary all the way through high school and when i got to college you know of course they give you those tests to see where to place you and i place i scored right at grade level grade 13 my first year in college um, before the first semester started. And my academic advisor told me I needed to take a remedial reading course. And uh, we had a powwow back and forth about that because I told her I didn't need a reading course because I knew how to read. Well, during that time, you know, I will admit, a lot of times I would read and my comprehension wasn't really where it needed to be. And I had to admit that. But here I was, my first semester at the University of Houston, enrolled in a remedial reading class and an honors English class. Now you figure that one out. So I was telling my advisor, I said, I scored at level. She said, yeah, but looking at the rest of your academic scores, you're way behind in reading. She said, so I need you to take this remedial reading class. And I think the thing that got me is I had never been considered remedial before. I mean, that, that can do something to your ego. And so I bit the bullet and I took the remedial reading class. And if reading was a struggle for me as somebody who read every day and to this day still reads every day. Can you imagine what it looks like 
it's going to look like for the kid who gets to college and nobody's instilled the love of reading in him. I didn't wait for my parents to tell me to read. There used to be something called a bookmobile, a mobile, mobile library. And I was walking home from kindergarten one day. Yeah, back then you could walk home almost safely. Uh, looking at some things now, it wasn't safe back then either. We just didn't have access to all of this uh, news that we have now. It was just as dangerous back then, but we didn't know it. And I, it was a Kmart parking lot, and the bookmobile was there one day. And you know, I walked in to see what it was, and they told me what it was, and you could check out books. I didn't wait to go home and ask my mom, could I check out books? I checked out some books. <laughs> Because I just love to read. My mom never had to tell me to read. It's just something I enjoy. I've never been a big TV watch. I mean, it'll, you might come to my house tonight and be on. But my wife will tell you most of the time, he doesn't have a clue what's happening. <laughs> you know, she'll leave out of the room and she'll come back in. She'll say, so what's going on? I said, I don't know. <laughs> because guess what I'm doing if I don't have a book in my hand a lot of time? I have something on my computer screen reading. <laughs> And that was actually an issue that uh, I had to get over when I first started dating my wife. Because we would go out to restaurants, and because I love to read so much, I would take the menus and I would ask the waitress, could I keep the menu so I could read everything on the menu while I was sitting at the table while she's sitting across from me? I hadn't been taught how to date. I didn't know. And so that's another thing, you know, we have to teach our kids how to properly date. And in essence, we're doing it in, in reverse. We're supposed to marry to date, not date to marry. But that's a whole nother topic for another day. But like I said, we need to get some economics because in the grand scheme of things, if we're going to live the proper life, our women shouldn't be going, getting, waking up every morning, getting dolled up to be pretty, to sit in front of another man all day long. And then when she comes home to you, she's tired and bringing you the leftovers. So she got pretty for another man and she's bringing you the leftovers. And then when she gets home, you still, her, her work is not done. And then we want to know why she tell us she's tired and got a headache. <laughs> it's because she's giving her energy to another man all day long. And so, if we really understand that, we start trying to figure out how we can earn enough resources and income to bring our wives home from work. And I dropped the ball in there, I'll be honest. Because there's a friend from college, you know, we talked one day not long ago. And she said, Myron, she said, you always told me you never really want to get married until you had enough money where your wife never had to work. And I said, oh, I dropped the ball in that. And had I been taught some of the things I'm talking about now, as far as business ownership and things, I probably could have done it uh, sooner. And my wife wouldn't have had to wait till I got out the hospital. I was so bad I couldn't do anything on my own where she had to take care of me for a while. That's when my wife had to retire. And so don't put yourself in that position. You know, let's be proactive and get in front of it. And so I, I never wanted my wife to work. Uh, I never felt good about that, to be honest with you. And that aided me every year that she had to work, to be honest with you. And so We'll hear it said all the time that we need two incomes to live. Well, that just depends on how you're trying to live. If you need two incomes to live, that probably means we're living above our means. <laughs> we're stretched to the limit. I mean, who came up with the idea of a 30-year death grip? And what am I talking about? If you look up the root meaning of the word mortgage, it means death grip. Mort means death, and gauge means grip, death grip. That's what a mortgage is. Who pickled our brains to tell us, hey, 
we, we go get a house, let's just say a hundred thousand. At the at the end of the thirty year period, you're gonna pay three hundred, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for that same house, for a hundred thousand dollar house. Who sold us on that? Who sold us on the idea of taking our women away from teaching our kids our principles and values? Who sold us on that? Why do we follow that? But if we had business ownership, and especially if we operated out of our homes, I mean, that looks like it's going to be the new normal. I mean, I'm so tired of hearing that word, though, but that could be your normal. Start a business, make it viable, employ your wife, and still, you know, business. And employ your kids. Why teach your kids to go to school, get a good education, so you can get a good job in a white-owned company, and the white-owned company is not going to pay them the same thing that they're going to pay a white employee. And how do I know that? Because I did research on that too. I mean, the last 15 and 20 years of my life have been spent in study. And blacks with a bachelor's degree earn less than a white man with a high school diploma. Blacks with a master's degree earn less than a white man with a high school diploma. Blacks with PhDs, in many cases, earn less than a white man with a high school diploma. Don't take my word for it. Do your own research. So we keep complaining about the system, which hasn't been favorable to us ever, but we keep going to the system. I mean, explain to me how that works. It just doesn't make sense why we keep doing. What what have we heard over and over again? The definition of insanity is doing the same things over and over again, expecting different results. I mean, how long would you go up to a wall and you know there's something greater on the other side but you keep you keep walking up to this wall and you take your forehead and you keep bumping it up against the wall, bumping it up against the wall. Every day you go to this wall, you bump it up against the wall, you bump it up against the wall. You go back, you keep doing that. You do that five days a week. You do it six days a week. If you work in retail management like me, you do it seven days a week. Keep hitting your head up against the same wall. At some point, you, your head's going to start hurting. And if you keep doing, the head's going to start bleeding. You keep doing you're gonna get a knot on your head. And so we keep hitting our head up against that wall, but we, for some reason, won't take five steps to the left and turn the knob on the door and walk through to the other side. What kind of sense does that make? You know, you go over there and it says open, but we come back the next day because we got business ownership if you walk through the turn the knob and open the door. But you got business ownership on that side, but we keep walking over here to this wall that says, go to school, get a good education, so you can get a good job for somebody else and have no control over your own life, have no control over your own time, have no time to spend with your wife, have no time to spend with your kids, have no time for recreational activities except on Saturday and Sunday when everybody else in society who's doing the same thing at the same time. You know, the golf courses are not crowded Monday through Friday. <laughs> and I don't play golf, but I've driven by enough of them to notice. But if I drive by on a Saturday, it's crowded. And so why do we keep beating our head up against the same wall over and over and over again? We won't get mad at the people who told us to follow that system, but we'll get angry at somebody who comes and talks to us and say, hey, there's another way. Will you listen to me? Most of us, no, we won't listen. And so I'm just going to say, I'm not going to listen. I enjoy beating my head up against this wall. 
and and once it start hurting and bleeding too much on the forehead, I'm gonna try to beat a hole through with the back of my head now. <laughs> Until that one starts bleeding and gets a knot on it. And then when that happens, we'll turn around and start beating our forehead up against it again because it's kind of healed up by that time. And then next thing you know, 30 years have passed. What you got to show for it. 40 years have passed. That's when they're kicking you out the pasture if they let you last that long. But this, the job system is proven not to be. And I mean, people can become rich that way, but it's, it's by far the hardest way to do it. And these older folks that we see taking jobs again, they're not doing it because they're lonely. They're doing it because what they put up for retirement coupled with what Social Security is paying them. And just so you know, Social Security is said to be exhausted in the year 2035. So that's less than 15 years from now. And so if your retirement age, I mean, at my age, that means by the time society says, you know, throw them out the pasture, there's going to be nothing for me. And you know the thing about it? My dad told me that was going to happen years ago because the people you elect said as soon as our ancestors put that money into a social security fund, they said that money didn't belong to us anyway, anymore. Do your research. And so we don't want to get to our golden years and then have to go seek out employment somewhere else. That's no fun. Huh? I mean, it's no fun at all. My dad did very well with the money he earned on the job. And, you know, it, it took care of he and my mother. And uh, he set it up with my mother to be taken care of. And, uh, should he pass, when he passed, and he passed almost a year ago. And my mother's taken care of. But, we need to break that mold of go to school, get a good, good education so we can get a good job. How about go to school? We're going to start business as adults. And then we're going to teach our kids how to own business because we're going to be the ones to employ them. Now, there's tax laws in place where up to a certain age, you can pay your kid every year tax free in your business and then you can write that off in your taxes <laughs> now talk to your tax preparer I'm not a tax preparer they're accountant but they can tell you how to do that and so you lower your tax base and then your kids can take that money they earn and they can buy their school clothes and school supplies and things like that I mean you got to learn how to do things we got to get out our, our Access to information has been so limited for so long, and we don't understand it because we keep thinking, okay, this time I'm gonna my my parents beat the head against this spot in the wall, so I'm gonna step to the right ten feet and I'm gonna beat my head on this point of the wall. But you gotta go five paces to the left to walk through the door to get to the other side of the wall. Unfortunately, most people in our society are not willing to go through the door. And I read somewhere years ago in a book, it said freedom requires responsibility. And what many of us keep proving is we love to be irresponsible. And so we're going to have to make some changes. I mean, none of us know what the future holds. With what we're dealing with right now, like I said, it's been almost, let's see, March 13th, let's see, April, May, June, July, August. So, a little bit over five months since the lockdowns and everything shifted in this country. They were already in place in other countries already. So, we don't know. Do we know what's going to happen uh, six months from now? What if? You're one of those people 
who actually work from home right now? What if you're one of those people who aren't employed right now because your company had to shut its doors for, for a moment? So, what if this lockdown, I mean, and we're in a semi-lockdown right now, not total, but one of your presidential, the other presidential candidate that's running has already said he's going to lock down to the society, the whole country, to deal with COVID. <laughs> well, ironically, Sweden did lock down, and their cases continue to shrink. <laughs> Because it ain't a virus, virus. So when you start understanding what they think is what they're doing, you might open your eyes a little bit. So none of us know how long this thing is going to last. What if we're still at home for the next six to 12 months? I mean, that's easy for the teachers. But what about your industry? What if we have a situation, situation such as what's going on in New Zealand, where 8 to 5, 8 p.m. to 5 a.m., you have a curfew. Nobody can be outside. Only one person can leave your house per day to do shopping or any other errands like that. You get one hour outside to exercise if you want to. One hour. What do they do to prisoners in solitary confinement? Give them one hour a day. Then they have 23 hours lockdown, one hour of freedom. That's what that sounds like to me. And we think, I mean, look how easy it was for us to give up our rights. Excuse me. What if the, the company you worked for shuts its doors permanently while we're doing, dealing with the situation? What are you going to do? What if you're not earning your current income in the next six months? What about the next 12 months? What if you are in a position where the company you work for says you can't come back to work unless you take the vaccine? What if? You know what the thing is? The people who make the most money in this society are in sales. And salesmen have been put down all for the loans. And there are a lot of unscrupulous salesmen out there. You know, I'm not going to say that. But we think, just, just take Microsoft. We think Microsoft sells software. No. Microsoft sells software in an operating system that no computer can operate without. Microsoft is selling a system. And McDonald's doesn't sell hamburgers. It sells real estate that turns a profit. The franchisees sell hamburgers, but McDonald's itself sells profit making real estate. Amazon and Walmart don't make anything. Yeah, their name is on a few products that they get the other same companies that are making the name brand stuff to make. But look at, I think Amazon profits up. I just read something earlier. Um, well, this is, well, earlier, late yesterday, I ain't going to say early, earlier while I've been up, but uh, I guess about two and a half, three hours ago, and it was saying Amazon's profits are up 100% these last five months. Walmart's profits are up 80% this time last, uh, over the last five months. My wife was in Sam's one day last week, and she said the guy that was talking to her in the Sam's store told her by April, Sam's had already made more money than they made in all of 2019. So while we're putting sales down, these companies are selling us everything. None of these companies... Amazon, Walmart, Sam, none of these companies make anything, but they sell everything. <laughs> but we put sales down. And so they're selling other people's products and becoming extremely wealthy. 
And so it's real easy for a lot of people to say, stay at home and don't do that. I mean, you can stay at home, but how about figuring out how to position yourself to capture some of this online money? I mean, there's a lot of money being made online right now. You don't have to have the billions of dollars like Amazon and Walmart and Sam's and all that. But what would an extra two, three, four, five thousand dollars a month do for you? What would an extra five hundred dollars a month do for you if you just found out a way to capture some of this money that's being made online? Positioning yourself as an online business owner. You don't have to make anything. You can sell other products that are already in place. But it's going to take a change in mentality. It's going to take a change in mindset. And so the problem is many of us don't want to think about the what if prospects. What if places us in a proactive position of responsibility. And I heard this guy say slaves like to be irresponsible. Many people in society don't want to be responsible. And they live in an enslavement camp that they created in their own minds. Because, you know, you can always change your mind on things. But unfortunately, we don't many times. And so we're going to have to figure out a way to start us in businesses. And I'm not saying go out and try to change the world overnight. How about changing you overnight? That's all it takes you. The first step starts with you. And I've flown several different airlines. United, Continental, when they were around before United merged and bought them. Southwest, American, U.S. Air. And, uh, did I say American Airlines? I don't remember. It, <laughs> I'm looking at the clock now. It's 2.15. I've just been talking. <laughs> but uh, each one of them doing flight preparation when a flight attendant comes over to intercom and some of them actually use a pre-recorded message now but they'll tell you every last one of them if cabin pressure drops and you're traveling with somebody that needs assistance maybe an elderly person maybe a small kid or something they tell you the first thing you need to do is put your own oxygen mask on first. He said, because if you try to help the person that needs help, you might not last, and so you compromise the life of you and the person that needs help. So, I guess to sum up all this rambling I've been doing for the last hour and 18 minutes, <laughs> is to say, put your own oxygen mask on first.